is focused in the last one of the 66, the book of Revelation. In the 14th chapter of this book, beginning with the 6th verse, we have a picture of three angels flying in the midst of heaven. And John on Patmos, as he beheld them, was inspired to write down their message. And by inspiration, he called it the everlasting gospel. It's to be preached to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Seventh-day Adventists see their particular work in this generation as being pictured in this particular passage. Seventh-day Adventists, in repeating Revelation 14, 6 to 12, say, as Jesus did in Nazareth nearly 2,000 years ago when he read Isaiah 61, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. It's a wonderful thing to find in the scripture those passages which especially bear on the problems of this generation. And to see yourself as being a fulfillment of prophecy. This is the privilege of those who study these wonderful books of Daniel and Revelation. I read Revelation 14, 6, beginning. I saw another angel, and that word angel means messenger. It's often translated that way. Another messenger in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The second angel follows, announcing the fall of earth's confused interpretations of God. And then in the ninth verse, the warning against false worship. And then the grand climax in the twelfth verse, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. <clears throat> Following this, in the 14th verse, we see the Savior coming in the clouds of heaven to reap the harvest of the earth, to gather his people home, put an end to sin, and usher in the reign of everlasting peace. It's a wonderful prospect, dear friend. Wonderful prospect. We focus then tonight on this message, the everlasting gospel. Our subject tonight is the gospel in practice, for inspiration tells us that medical missionary work is the gospel in practice, the compassion of Christ revealed. What is this gospel which the angel messenger proclaims? What is the gospel which is to be practiced in medical ministry? This word gospel means good news, glad tidings. And there are certainly glad tidings available for those who will listen to the word of God in this hour. You remember that when Christ came, he began his ministry by saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1, 15 and 16. The gospel in our text is said to be everlasting or eternal. God's message of hope and comfort in a sense is the same for all ages. It's the good news of deliverance. As we read the other evening in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the 
power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The gospel then is the power through which heaven brings deliverance to every slave of sin, to every victim of disease and sickness, every discouraged, dispirited one. The gospel is the glad tidings that Christ is the one who can deliver the captive, set free the slave, and bring victory in the life. There are two phases of this wonderful gospel message that I wish to notice especially tonight, and the relation of medical missionary work, whether performed by a physician, nurse, or layman, the relation of medical missionary work to these two phases. Those of you who were here the other evening when we introduced this series, remember that we focused especially on the revelation of the love of God in the gospel. And this is to be made practical by ministry to the sick and the needy. This is why Christ spent so much of his time in the healing of the sick. When a person is sick, and the world is full of sickness, isn't it? When a person is sick, there is nothing that appeals to him more than some kind of relief. And as Jesus went through the towns and villages and into the great cities of his time, wherever he went, the healing power of his love reached the sick and suffering and brought relief. But before he began that ministry in Capernaum in Jerusalem, he spent his years growing up as a boy and as a young man in Nazareth. And there, although he did not work miracles by the touch of his hand or his creative word as he did in his public ministry, yet the healing power of love was revealed through him and many a sad heart Many a sick body was blessed by that ministry of love. As I mentioned the other evening, most of us, you and I, are now in that period of Christ's, following Christ's example, that period where he worked through that healing power of love without the power to work instantaneous <coughs> miracles. Probably few, if any, here tonight would go to a blind man and put your hand upon his eyes and say, Receive your sight. This doesn't mean that God's power is limited at all. It means that God is now teaching us, as he used Jesus during those years at Nazareth, to do what we can to relieve the sorrows and woes of a distraught world through kindly ministry. Jesus is our example in this, and he has committed to his people this ministry of mercy. That's why we have physicians and nurses who love God and love their fellow men enough to try to relieve their suffering using all the means that science has made available, utilizing the remedies that God has provided what for? In order to reveal the love of heaven to a sick and sad world. I'm so thankful that like the Good Samaritan that Jesus told about, it is our privilege to minister to those who have been beaten and left by the roadside, either literally or symbolically, suffering through the attacks of the great enemy, I say it's a privilege that you and I have to watch for the opportunities to help suffering humanity. And the world is filling up with the cases of need all about us. But I call your attention to this fact tonight, that if all that is done and all that were done were simply to relieve suffering, If that suffering must continue, 
then the story does not have a happy ending. There must come an experience in which man is not only relieved of suffering, but cured of the transgression which made the suffering. One of my dentist friends was telling me this experience impressed me very much. Being a medical missionary, this dentist not only seeks to relieve suffering through filling teeth or pulling those that are too diseased to treat, but he seeks to educate. A little boy about eight years old was brought in by his mother, and as the dentist examined this little fellow, he found several teeth that needed attention. And he said to the mother, Now, I want to tell you some things that you can do to keep him from needing so many fillings in the years to come. And so my dentist friend began to tell this mother about the harmful effects of these concentrated sugar solutions that people get by eating candy and drinking soda pop and eating popsicles and ice cream and candy and other things, especially between meals. And he said, now, if you'll bring him back in six months, in the meantime, help him to eat regularly of good natural food and keep away from these sugar things, especially between meals. And so mother and the little boy went home. And do you know, six months later, they came back and he found some more work that needed to be done. And the mother told him this story. She said, Doctor, she said, I tried to do what you said, but do you know, when the man comes around our neighborhood ringing the little bell, and all the children in the neighborhood run out to get the popsicles. She said, it's pretty hard on my little fellow. And she said, we have a chain link fence around our yard. And so he's kept in there. But she said, finally, I went out there and there was one of the neighbor boys that had gotten a popsicle and had poked it through the fence. <laughs> And my boy was taking it. She said, Doctor, I think you'll just have to prepare to fill his teeth from time to time. Now we smile, and yet, friends, it's something in a sense to weep about, isn't it? Because you multiply that by millions of people in hundreds of transgressions, and you have the attitude of many a heart. What is it? I cannot reach the standard of hell. So fill my teeth, give me some medicine, do something so I can keep on doing the way I am doing and still not suffer too much. Medical missionary work is the gospel in practice. And I want you to notice what Jesus did in preaching the gospel and in practicing it. Turn to John, the fifth chapter and the 14th verse. John 5, 14. This fifth chapter of John, you remember, tells the wonderful story of healing the man who was a paralytic, had been for 38 years. And Jesus healed him by his wonderful touch of love. And then notice what he followed, how he followed up this relief. John 5, 14. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. You're all well now. Everything fine. Sin no more. 
lest a worse thing come unto thee. A whole volume is comprehended in these few words. You're made well. You're not sick anymore. But I have something to tell you. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. In these words he showed what the real cause of sickness is. It's sin, transgression. It isn't always the fault of the one that's sick. It may be his parents, or it may be somebody else. But all suffering is the result, directly or indirectly, of sin. And most of us find most of our sickness through our own transgression. You notice I've left a loophole for people that aren't. But I say most of us, when we are sick, if we look into it, and that's what good medical work is for, is to help us find out what the cause of sickness is, what the transgression is. For sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. And this relates to the physical law as well as to the spiritual law. It relates to how people get sick as well as how they get sad. And so Jesus is saying to this man that he's healed, I have something for you to do. Avoid the thing that made you sick. Obviously, the only way that anybody can carry on such a ministry is to help people find out what it is that's causing sickness. That's why we have five-day plans to help people get away from smoking. That's why we have cooking classes to help people learn how to cook without so much cholesterol and heavy fat. That's why we have 101 other methods and media through which to help people to learn the laws of health. For back of all these practical things in getting away from smoking and other poisons and in learning how to cook and exercise, back of it is a firm conviction that the laws of nature are the laws of God as truly as the Ten Commandments. The same divine hand that wrote the Ten Precepts upon the stone, that same hand wrote the laws of our being upon every nerve and muscle and fiber of our bodies. And as we are to find in the Ten Commandments the revelation of God's will for man morally, so in our study of physiology we are to find the revelation of his will as it relates to the care of our bodies. You know, I've thought of it, dear friends. Suppose some friend of yours should decide to take a trip and be gone, we'll say for a year, to Europe or to the Far East. And suppose that friend should say to you, I want you to take care of my house while I'm away. Suppose it's a beautiful mansion, a palatial home. You're honored by the request of your friend to be the custodian of that house. Suppose after you had accepted the responsibility, you should find out that the home is really worth ten times as much as you had thought it was. Again, your appreciation of the honor shown to you, the confidence expressed by the man who owns it, has been increased. Am I right? and probably your own response would be sharpened. You would say, my, 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 this house is really worth a lot. I must be careful that I take care of it. But do you know, you and I have been entrusted with a building worth infinitely more than any home, no matter how expensive are its materials. Your body, the Bible says, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. And God intends that every nurse, every physician, every dietitian, 
and every other person who is acquainted with these laws of health should be an educator teaching others the great laws of life written in the body and that every one of them is meant for our happiness. I was visiting with a friend of mine and as we were talking together he told me of the decision that he had come to to quit smoking and how glad he was. He said, I wouldn't for a thousand dollars go back to the smoking habit. But meanwhile his partner was sitting across the table puffing one cigarette after the other. So I told the young man, I said, you know, we're having a five-day plan down at the Chattanooga YMCA, and perhaps you'd like to get in on this and get the same help your partner has gotten. Well, he said, I'll tell you, Mr. Frizee. I think if anybody's going to quit smoking, he has to want to very much. I said, I agree with you. And then I asked him, I said, would you be interested in knowing what I have found to be the greatest incentive, the greatest reason that a man might want to quit? Yes, he said. And then I began to talk to him about the value of the human body. I told him about a boy who had been kidnapped and held for ransom. His father had to pay nearly a million dollars to get him back. And I asked him if he thought the boy was worth that much. Well, he smiled and said he was, he was to his father. Um. <coughs> now I said, do you know that a ransom was paid for you? The boy was worth a million dollars at least to his father. How much are you worth to the one who paid his life upon the cross for your redemption? I said, when a man begins to understand that, when a man begins to see how valuable he is to the one who created him, he sees that his lungs are too valuable. to be blackened with tobacco tar, that his brain is too valuable to be interfered with by whiskey or beer or wine, that his whole system is too precious to the one who created him to be in any way hampered or hindered or made more prone to disease. Do you see, dear friends, what we're dealing with? This is the gospel in practice. We're to be not merely those who relieve suffering. We're to echo the words of Jesus, sin no more lest the worst thing come unto thee. This includes health education. And God intends that every physician, every nurse, and every layman to the extent of his ability should be somebody to spread the light and knowledge of health principles. Why? Because human beings are too valuable, too valuable to be polluted with disease and the habits that bring disease. Your heart, your lungs, your liver, your stomach, your brain are valuable. They cannot be replaced. And Jesus thought your body, as well as your eternal life, was so important that he gave his life for the redemption. That's what the scriptures teaches, and this is the gospel. In the book Ministry of Healing, which is a wonderful presentation of these wonderful themes, I read on page 113. Christ taught that health could be preserved only by obedience. 
the physician, and may I put in brackets and the nurse, and every other health educator, should teach his patients that they are to cooperate with God in the work of restoration. The laws of nature, as truly as the precepts of the Decalogue, are divine, and only in obedience to them can health be recovered or preserved. Notice that the focus is not on something in a bottle or in the syringe that can be introduced in the body by mouth or through the bloodstream that will do away with all the effects of transgression. That's not where the focus is. The focus is on bringing man back into harmony with the laws which have been transgressed. This requires, as I've indicated, education and motivation. Either one without the other is not sufficient. We must be educated that we may know what it is that needs changing in the lifestyle, but we must be motivated or else it falls on deaf ears. Not long ago, a survey was conducted in Chicago. Hundreds of people were interviewed on the streets and in their homes. The effort was to find out how widespread the knowledge of nutrition and other health sciences might be in a practical way. How many people, what percentage of the people, for instance, knew that smoking rendered people more likely to have lung cancer? How many people knew that high-fat diet and a diet rich in cholesterol rendered people more likely to have heart attacks? How many people knew that exercise was important to avoid heart attacks and some of these other conditions? And so they went down the list of these things. And you know what they found? A vast majority of the people that were interviewed knew these different facts that science has brought to view. But that wasn't the end of the questionnaire. The sad thing was they discovered that most of those who knew it weren't doing very much about it. Isn't that pitiful, dear friends? Yes, but some men who ought to know better set the example. The man who announced a few years ago the findings of science on the effect of tobacco on the lungs was puffing a cigar as he gave his announcement to the press. So I repeat, it takes more than education. It takes more than research. It takes more than teaching. It takes motivation. And thank God the gospel provides this. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Oh, I am so glad, dear friends, that as we reach out, to relieve the suffering of men and women, we can also reach up to the throne of God and lay hold of divine power to help the sufferer not only to find relief from pain and sickness, but find release from the bondage and slavery of habits that have brought these sicknesses on. There is victory through Christ. There is deliverance through Christ. Whatever the habit, the master passion which holds a person captive, there is deliverance. And you know, it isn't just the drug habits like tobacco and alcohol. Some people have found by experience that to break the hold of inordinate appetite may be as difficult as breaking the whiskey habit or the tobacco habit. Appetite, you remember, was the point on which our first parents failed. Adam and Eve brought transgression into this world by starting to eat something that God said, don't eat it. Don't eat it. Christ undertook the salvation of men by beginning where Adam and Eve had failed. And he resisted the clamors of appetite and overcame 
that you and I might have victory in our lives. And so if our problem is in the eating rather than in the drug scene, there is deliverance and victory for us. And if we are to reach out the helping hand to those who have gotten sick, whatever the name of the disease, gotten sick through overeating or eating at the wrong time or not eating the right things, we must have in our own experience the assurance that there is help in the gospel in those practical things. Every nurse, every physician should be an example in these things. In the book Councils on Diet and Foods, a wonderful volume, page 75 I read, <clears throat> The Lord has given instruction that the gospel is to be carried forward, and the gospel includes health reform in all its phases. What does the gospel include? Health reform in all its phases. Under the influence of the gospel, great reforms will be made by medical missionary work. But separate medical missionary work from the gospel and the work will be crippled. Which will be crippled? Both will be crippled, friends. The work of preaching the message will be crippled if it lacks the right arm of the medical missionary work. But medical missionary work will be crippled uh, if it's divorced from the gospel because it lacks the motivation, the power that helps people to do what they're taught to do. But put them together, the gospel message of salvation from sin and the sweet message of deliverance from evil habits through an understanding of scientific truth in physiology and applying the gospel to these problems. Put it all together, friends, and you have the answer for universal disorganization. That's the threefold message. And so this evening, I thank God for a message that is going all over this world with this wonderful truth of restoration, telling people that no matter how great their sins have been, there is deliverance, that no matter how great their guilt is, there is forgiveness, that no matter how vicious is the habit that holds them, there is release. Thank God medical missionaries have been going down now for decades to the South Sea Islands and there where people have been cannibals for generations, where every named and unnamed vice is practiced, where people have sunk so low that government officials have thought that nothing could be done to reach some of those native populations. Medical missionaries have gone down there with a threefold message and have helped the people physically, mentally, and spiritually, and whole islands have become cleaned up, the pigs gone, the tobacco gone, the liquor gone, every vice gone, and people living happy, happy lives under the influence of the gospel. Down there, this message is known in its work as the people of the clean church. The clean church. It cleans them up inside and out. Thank God it can do it all over the world and is doing it all over the world. Tomorrow evening from this pulpit, Bill Dahl, who has traveled around the world as a medical missionary, will be bringing us some precious things and I know you'll want to hear it. And now tonight, we're going to spend a little time in witness as different ones of you, you visitors, and everybody else are invited to just come up here to the platform where your voice can be carried easily through the microphone. Whatever you'd like to say in thanksgiving for the gospel, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, let the one who made you, who redeemed you with his precious blood, let him know 
that you are happy to have a part with him in experiencing these things in your own life and in sharing them with others to the glory of his name. All I can say is that I was a native in the United States and I praise the name of Jesus for what he has done for me and what he is going to allow me to do in the future for him. I simply have to share my gratitude for the blessing that the Lord has given me to be able to know the instructions that the Lord has given us to follow out in taking care of our bodies. I'm just so thankful that the Lord has allowed me to hear this message and to be able to live it. I pray that he would give me the strength every day to follow it. He will. Health, health reform is good news and I'm thankful for it too. That was short and sweet, wasn't it? When I first became an Adventist, it was through the health, re the health message. And there for a while, I was following the health rules. It says, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. And I did sin more, and I started back in my old habits. And a worse thing did come upon me. And now I have a few health problems. And with the Lord's help, He will give me strength and courage to follow the health reform. And I pray that He will give us all the strength. Thank you. You're going to learn it the second time around, aren't you? That's good. I have to come up and tell you how much I enjoy and appreciate the fact that Wildwood's having these seminars. Now, I had the good favor of being raised in the Adventist family that knew about health reform and practiced it. it had a lot to do with the start of it. But because they did these things doesn't mean that I did them. And I still lack areas of improvement. There's a lot of room yet. But my cup has been filled this weekend, and especially today as I was over at the Flemings and heard the marvelous things the Lord has been doing in their ministry. I'm working in the medical field and have been for years. But if the Lord wants me to do something else, I'm asking for the grace and the strength to do what he wants me to do. He's got his hand on you, brother. You know, I'm very happy to be able to share what the Lord has done. You know, it's one thing to be able to know something, but to practice it is a thing altogether different. And I'm very thankful that the Lord has given me a place here at Wildwood to come, you know, you read the books, medical ministry, the other things, you can read those. But if you don't have somewhere you can go where practice, what does it profit? So I'm just thankful that the Lord has given me an opportunity to be here, and I pray that you all will continue to pray for me as we try to do what the Lord wants us to do. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Listen, how long have you been here? Four months. You, where were you before then? Nashville, Tennessee, Meharry Medical College. What did you come down here for? I came to learn the Lord's methods of healing. Well, now let me read you something. The sanitariums which are established are to be closely and inseparably bound up with the gospel. And the gospel includes health reform in all its phases. That's why Wildwood Sanitarium's here. That's why you're here. We're all here for the same reason. Glad you're here. Amen. When I first became an Adventist, I knew there were a lot of habits that I had 
that needed to be changed. And many times I felt completely helpless and without strength to change the things I needed. needed it. Uh, I still feel without strength on my own, but I have found that when I look at Jesus and see the things he's helped me with in the past and how much he loved me, and I know that he loves me now, and as I read in the scriptures and I behold him, I have a greater desire to serve him, and that desire in itself helps me to overcome other things that are already bothering me. So I know in my own life, and I'm sure most of you do too, that we do need the motivation of love for Jesus to go along with the education we may already have. That's it. And wouldn't it be too bad if we could learn to do it without Jesus? No danger, but wouldn't it be too bad if it could be? I'm glad we have a fellowship with him. I'm thankful for God's grace to help us overcome our cultivated tendencies and also those that we have learned and that he is anxious to help us. I pray that I will be just as anxious to cooperate with him. I'm happy tonight that the gospel is good news every day, not just at the beginning, but all along the way. And I'm happy that Jesus will uh, help us right where we are to walk with him. And he'll give us strength and peace and happiness and maybe even a little bit of enthusiasm so when we walk down the street people can say say i wish i could be like that <laughs> i wish that uh, you know that the future looked bright instead of sad i'm happy tonight that some of the adventists can be the happiest people in the world i'm thankful to the lord tonight for the master passions that he's delivered me from and sins in my life. I've been thinking as we've been talking how good he's been and I just want to thank him and I know that he can finish the good work that he's begun in me. I wanted to share with you a precious experience and opportunity that Larry and I had this week. Uh, one of the people that came to the cooking school was sharing with a friend of his some of the things that he'd learned and about these classes and everything and foods for life and so this man decided he'd call up the store and see what kind of people these were so he called up the store and someone talked to him on the phone and he thought well they're not bad they sound pretty friendly and this individual happens to have a radio talk show from four or six in the morning and his name is Lee Starnes and he asked us to come and talk about nutrition on his talk show from four to six in the morning. So Laura, <laughs> Laura in, volunteered my husband and I. So, so we, we, you know, I called him up and I asked him all about it. And, and, and so he accepted the invitation. Well, the night before, I reminded my husband, you know, we had to be at this place at four in the morning. And he just wasn't too excited about it. So I, you know, I prayed that the Lord would help us to get there, and we, we got up at 3 in the morning, you know, and bleary-eyed, we went out in the dark, you know. And, and we even got a police escort to the studio because this policeman followed us and thought we were going to cause some trouble or something. And when we got there, he, you know, he said, okay, everything's fine, you may go in. So we went in, and we had a, actually the most wonderful experience, this, this, man has three serious diseases. He's a brittle diabetic, he smokes one cigarette after another, and he has psoriasis. And he, he didn't even open up the telephones. It's one of those things where you call in, ask a question, and then you, you know, we answer, so to speak. And uh, he wouldn't even open up the phones for about an hour. It was a two-hour talk show. He just kept asking us one question after another. And you know, I know the Lord was working on this man's heart and putting a desire in his heart for something better. And I'm so thankful. It doesn't matter who we are, if we practice and take these precious principles and share them, it just grows more precious to us day by day. It's like dropping a pebble, you know, in a lake and watching the little rings go out. And I just thank the Lord tonight for all his blessings. One of the lecturers yesterday mentioned that in teaching, 
to be simple. Don't try to be too complicated. And that uh, people really understand better what you're trying to tell them. And if you think about it, everybody can be a medical missionary. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not a medical missionary, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not a nurse, but we really can. And we are 24 hours a day. When we get up in the morning, we practice the eight natural remedies in one way or another all through the day. And even, of course, when we're sleeping, we're getting our rest. So I'm thankful there's a place for everyone. I'm sure that each one here tonight believes that the Lord has a timetable. And in due time, the events occur. They don't occur because man decides this is what I have to do or this is what I have to show or this is what I have to say. One of the experiences that I learned at Wildwood was that I suppose like Moses, I'm not prepared. I suppose if Moses had been left on his own, he would never have been prepared. With myself, I, I used to say, I'm not ready for Wildwood because I'm not prepared. Well, that's probably why he sent me here, to get prepared. During the past week, I would say that there's been showers of blessings. It's not because man has come to the focus in any of these events. It's because the Lord feels that it is time to move, to proclaim and give emphasis to what this is all about as far as the health message is concerned. This past week in one of the newspapers was an outstanding article on health food. During the same week we had the nurses seminar. And then also, we also had this past week, so many of us know that CBS, Columbia Broadcasting System, came to Wildwood to televise, to see the lifestyle to see what is the nucleus of Adventism. Those of us that have had the experience talking to these various individuals gained many blessings. And I suppose it would be an opportunity for each one to say, look what's happening to us. But that's not the time, because I think the Lord is testing us to see how humble and compassionate we can be. Certainly, one of the newspapers tonight said of one of the greatest things that ever happened to Wildwood, possibly. But he doesn't know prophecy, I suppose, because there'll be greater things that will occur. I'd like to read just one closing statement. I met one of the gentlemen just before he left tonight and he said something that I feel that no matter what they took, what they showed, and what they displayed, but to me is a true picture of what they came to see and I hope caught a glimpse of. This individual said to me, I've been around quite a bit and I've never seen a body of people so steadfast in principles that are so dear to them. Well, it isn't because I believe the principles or you believe the principles. It's because the Lord has showed it to us and we're following suit. But in closing, let me say this. There was a verbal interchange between some of these individuals and some of, the, some of our staff that was very much responsible to help pull this together. And the conversation came about the institution and the health message. And one of the staff members said to this individual, it is understandable. 
we are saving lives out here. And I won't go through the details of what was before that. But what I was very much impressed is what the director of that CBS said. He was asked for the impressions of the institution. And he said, I am convinced. This is not just by chance, my friends. I believe that our prayers have gone forth and the power of the Holy Spirit has been on our campus this past week. This individual happened to be, as he said to me, I'm a reform Catholic, but looking. He also mentioned, he said that this is the place that my wife should be. Hearts are going to be touched. Millions are going to see exactly what Seventh-day Adventism is all about. We've had a very small part. This is no time, my friends, to put out our chests, as I said before, but only to be humble, compassionate, and let the power of the Holy Spirit bring forth what's in here and what's in here. Tonight I'm grateful and thankful for the beauty in the simplicity of the gospel. I'm so thankful what Jesus gave us in his word and in divine inspiration that nothing is complicated. I don't have to go to a drugstore and look out of a bottle of something I don't know what it is. In the eight natural remedies I see the beauty of the simplicity of the love of Jesus. Every one of those principles demonstrate to me the love and the compassion of Jesus for his people. And I'm so grateful that he allowed me to hear this and be part of it, to be part of the clean church. And my prayer is that he will keep me till this day, that we will all be with him. Thank you. Part of the health message that I'm particularly thankful for tonight is the as I thought about these people coming to find out about Adventism and Wildwood, is the part of a family. You know, it's interesting how the Lord has made all these things possible. Uh, restaurants, health food stores, medical missionary work, sanitariums, are all fairly much dependent on one big family working together. And this is probably the greatest miracle that most people see when they see something like this. And I'm thankful for the family that I can see, and I'm thankful for the family that I can see by faith waiting to come in and join us in this kind, kind of program. And it's my prayer that the Lord will help us to truly lengthen our cords and strengthen our stakes, that we can prepare for the family that God has for us. There's people who not only want to get, get well, but they want to enter right in in helping other people get well, because that's the greatest way in the world to spend your life, and I'm thankful for right. it. Thank you, brother. Well, dear ones, we're coming to the close of this little meeting. A precious day ahead of us tomorrow. I know you're going to be blessed in both in the morning and the afternoon and tomorrow night as Brother Dahl brings us some precious things. But tonight, as we go home, I'd like to lay this on your heart. It's too late in the day to be anywhere except where you belong. There are two reasons for being just where you belong. One is, if you're anywhere else than where you belong, you may be making problems. The other is, if you're not where you belong, you're missing some wonderful experience. I can't tell you where you belong, and nobody else can except Jesus. But he's in the business of calling people as he did Matthew and John and Peter in the long ago. Are there those here tonight who would like to say, Dear Lord, anywhere you want me, anything you want me to do, that's what I choose to do. May I see your hands? Shall we stand?
Precious Lord, we thank thee for the gospel. We thank thee for the gospel in practice. We thank thee for education and motivation. We thank thee for a Savior who made us in his image, redeemed us that we might be brought back to harmony. And tonight, the best we know how, we all want to choose to go with thee all the way. In the name of the one who died for us and who lives for us. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.